Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with Jonah Bronstein, my co-host. He, of course, uh, writes for the New Bronstein Times. And um, we have Armando Salguero from Outkick.com. He's going to be joining us uh, in a little bit to talk about the AFC East um, and how things look after the Bills just totally dismantled the Miami Dolphins on Sunday. And that's two games in a row in which the Bills have just destroyed the Dolphins, a team that came into this season with expectations of competing for the division title. But it looks like there's too big of a gap between uh, the Bills and the Dolphins, even though both are one and one uh, right now. Uh, Jonah, uh, the Bills uh, have Washington coming into town on Sunday. Um, what, are, what are your just your general thoughts on the Bills, where they stand after that disappointing loss to the Steelers, and then coming back with a, a statement game, at least on the defensive side of the ball, which seems odd to say. They did score five touchdowns, but the offense still looks shaky at times. Anyways, your general thoughts on these Bills. Well, I think it was a – Rather impressive result, which is an easy thing to say. We win 35 to nothing. But the fact that they won going away and by such a large margin without getting a great game out of Josh Allen and not being so dependent on him to make all the plays, which was often the case when they won last year, is very encouraging, especially if you think maybe there's a situation with an injury or uh, quarantines, contact tracing, things that limit the Bills passing game and ability to score a lot of points. Can they win in a different type of way? And just in general, that the defense has played well two games in a row. You know, they had a shutout game and a shutout half in the first game. And that's very encouraging that the defensive line and the front seven and really most all of the defense looks quite better than it was at this point last year. And if you combine that, if you can get the offense playing the way it was last year, then the Bills might really have a chance to be, uh, the team that everybody coming out of the preseason thought that they were. They did beat up on a backup quarterback, and after that, a young quarterback that maybe wasn't prepared for their pressure schemes and things like that. But now you got two more games against backup quarterbacks. The Bills have an opportunity, at least in the immediate short term, for more impressive results and to separate record-wise a little bit from the rest of the teams in the division. Yeah, the Bills uh, seem to have a favorable schedule coming up here and not any gimmies by any stretch, but uh, the opportunity, like you say, uh, to pull ahead and uh, get a comfortable lead within the division. Um, Yeah, Taylor Heineke with Washington uh, now playing for uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Uh, I don't think Ryan Fitzpatrick is anybody you fear uh, if he were coming back to Orchard Park. Uh, But Taylor Heineke. I don't know about that. I don't know about fear, but I think that you could see Ryan Fitzpatrick coming into Buffalo and playing well and, and making it at least a uh, competitive game. Right. But, but he doesn't win, you know, thinking about the jets game when the jets had to win uh, to be in, in the season finale uh, to get into the playoffs and Fitzpatrick throws an interception late in the game. And uh, he did play well for Miami last year against Buffalo, but another game that the bills won. Um, Heineke seems to be the, player du jour. Uh, I, I see just so much positive coverage of Taylor Heineke and wow, this, and this feature about how he's ready. And I don't know, it just, uh, it, it smacks of, well, we better tell our Taylor Heineke stories now. <laughs> well, while people still care who Taylor Heineke is, but uh, I don't see him coming into Orchard Park and, and giving the bills any trouble. Now, famous last words, perhaps, but um the Bills nine and a half point favorites uh, over football team. And uh, a lot of Bills fans, I'm surprised this. So I, I posted that on Sunday when the lines came out and I posted that the Bills were nine and a half point favorites and the Bills fans, even after a 35, nothing route came back at me with, wow, that seems a little high. You know, I, I think Bills fans are still, a little nervous, even after that lopsided victory down in in Miami gardens. Uh, I think they're still a little nervous as to, to what the bills are made of this season. 
Well, we'll talk to maybe Joel later in the week, but he didn't think the Bills could cover a three-and-a-half-point spread in Miami, and they beat that tenfold. So, uh, But I think it's good for the Bills to have some healthy – Bills fans to have some healthy uh, – maybe not skepticism, but not assume that – Cynicism, I think. Yeah, yeah, that not assume that – I guess we talked about a couple of weeks ago that uh, was the 11 win over under too low for the Bills. Why can't they win every game? Well, they're not going to win every game. And not every matchup is going to be a good matchup for them. They're probably not going to play well every week. So there's different things that happen in the ebb and flow of the season. And the Bills are a very good team and probably will have a good record. But week to week, uh, they're not guaranteed to win. And I don't think they're guaranteed to cover big point spreads. I could definitely see a situation where the Bills win this game and maybe – the outcome is never in doubt, but they don't cover a nine and a half point spread. That's a big spread uh, almost all of the time. There's very few matchups in the NFL where you get a double digit spread and you think, oh, that team's definitely going to cover. The Bills schedule coming up, just for the record, if you're wondering, uh, two games at home at Wa- or I'm sorry, two games at home versus Washington, then versus Houston. Uh, Terod Taylor was just put on injured reserve today, so that means he is definitely not going to be available. Uh, for a return match uh, against his uh, former team. And then a couple of prime time games at Kansas city at Tennessee before the bye week Um, And yeah, you could get some speed knots there um, against those two teams, especially in their stadiums uh, under the, under the spotlight. Uh, But then out of the bye week the bills host Miami on Halloween at Jacksonville. Jacksonville has not looked good. At the New York Jets, you got to figure that's a win. Uh, and then uh, they host Indianapolis. Uh, now we're getting towards uh, Thanksgiving and that game at New Orleans. So um, down the stretch, by the way, uh, New England at Tampa versus Carolina at New England versus Atlanta versus Jets. Um, I think that's, that, that's a favorable schedule uh, for the Bills with the way that shakes out. Uh, those uh, those two primetime games back to back, they'll be done and out of the way. And then uh, a lot of hay can be made uh, through uh, November and December. Uh, and I guess we need to say January now because of this uh, 17 game season. Um, the Bills will play two regular season games in January. Uh, um, See, I any think other thoughts? What's well, that? Uh, maybe you're drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit too much, and some of these fans tweeting you have a more uh, reasoned perspective about the Bills and the, how the seasons can go. You got to win in 15 games already and guaranteed to cover against Washington this week. <laughs> well, I mean, playing New England twice in December, uh, those will be tough games. New England will be a lot more rounded. Bill Belichick will know his team a lot more. Uh, Mac Jones will have a lot of snaps under his belt by then. I think that getting uh, at Mac Jones uh, earlier in the season would be uh, more beneficial. Uh, So I don't think that uh, they're sweeping New England. Um, They may, but Atlanta just isn't good. Two games against the Jets. Um, New Orleans, I'm not a Jameis Winston fan, even though New Orleans did have the big win uh, on opening day. It's a new Jameis, though. He's got new eyes. I'm not a Jacksonville. They get to play Miami again, a team that they've beaten by 65 points uh, combined over the last two uh, matches. So, no, I just uh, obviously at Tampa Bay is going to be difficult. So, yeah, there are some games in there that that'll be tough. Um, But as it stands right now, after two weeks and what we've seen from some of these opponents, uh, uh, I think uh, that if the Bills can get into a rhythm on, on offense. Of course they need to do that, but if they can, if they can find a semblance of that offense that they had last season, then yeah, I think they, they breeze into the playoffs. I would like to see the teams coming up on their schedule, give the bills more competition and not just to make the games better. And it would have been fun if it was Ryan Fitzpatrick leading Washington in here and Tyrod Taylor the next week leading Houston in there. We're not going to see that, but You know, we know that the Bills can beat teams that don't belong on the field with them or they have backup quarterbacks or that can't – that are at the bottom of the league. And if they have to – and if the schedule is loaded with those type of matchups and they play a lot of backup quarterbacks or a lot of teams that aren't at their best when they meet the Bills, that doesn't tell us a lot about 
how ultimately how good the Bills can be in the postseason. We've seen one maybe postseason type opponent so far against the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Bills didn't win that game and they played well in certain ways and they played poorly in other ways. So the games where the other team is, it's kind of like if you look at a college schedule, when you play in a lower division team, you don't learn too much about that team. If if the playing a team from the power five, you don't learn quite as much about UB, but when they play teams that are more evenly matched, you learn a lot more. And so I don't know. I don't have the schedule in front of me like you did, but the games when we're not sure if the bills are going to win the game or they aren't favored by too many points are when you really find out how good they are. For sure. And uh, we're going to break down the division here in a little bit with Armando Salguero about kick.com. He of course uh, covered the Miami dolphins for three decades uh, before uh, taking his new gig as a senior NFL writer without kick.com. But he was at the game on Sunday and, uh, wrote multiple stories, uh, not only from a Dolphins uh, perspective, but also from a Bills perspective, perspective because he is a national uh, NFL writer now. Uh, and he's going to have some thoughts uh, about the Dolphins and their rebuild and where it really puts them uh, in this AFC East race. I, I thought that uh, they would be a lot more competitive, of course, on Sunday than they were. Um, what did you think about the Bills' ability to run the ball and commitment to running the ball? It's easier to do when you're playing from ahead, but you think they solved some of those issues that maybe arose after the first game? Well, it was a much better game for the offensive line, particularly from an error standpoint. I think only – was there only one penalty? There was the Daryl Williams false start, uh, but those holding penalties went away. Um, John Feliciano, I thought, had a great game, uh, in the, especially uh, when it came to running the ball. Um, yeah, they came together. I think, though, that the Dolphins, to me, seemed like a team that had quit uh, by the second quarter. Uh, they were going for it on fourth down, which is kind of a, men- a mentality that, that is risky. Uh, they knew that the, that the Bills' defense was so good that they needed to start going for it on fourth down quite early in the game. Uh, they went for it, uh, I think, twice in the first half on fourth down, and then they needed to do it twice again in the second half. Uh, didn't convert any of them. Um, so it, to me, it was just a team that was so desperate. It was like the end of the game in the second quarter. And so then it was going through the motions and that obviously contributed to the bills being able to score five touchdowns. Um, yeah, my sense was the game was over after the quarterback injury. And I was wondering, we could talk to Armando about this as well, that the next time you see the dolphins, Deshaun Watson will be their quarterback the next time the Bills see that team. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely ask Armando about that. He has uh, some inside thoughts on that. He covers the team, and, and he knows all the, uh, you know, uh, you know, all the different decision makers there. And if if he's not talking to them, at least knows their thinking uh, on on that topic. It'll be interesting. A lot of it, quarterback injuries around the NFL are piling up. Uh, the Houston Texans, uh, even without Terod Taylor, are not going to put Deshaun Watson out on the field. Uh, but you have to think that that strengthens the Texans' um, leverage. Uh, teams need quarterbacks now more than they did a week ago, uh, in general, around the league, and the Dolphins in particular. Uh, so if you have playoff aspirations, maybe you roll those dice and uh, and give the Texans what they're asking for, which is a a King's ransom for Deshaun Watson. Um, well, my take on that real quick, and let's yeah. put aside the criminal investigation because that's a real complicating factor and maybe why this is going the way it is. But if Deshaun Watson is one of the five or six best quarterbacks in the league in a quarterback driven league and he's young. Uh, yeah. The Houston Texans can hold out and exert their leverage, but they're really doing a disservice to all of the football fans and the league itself by letting one of the very best marquee players just, idle away on their bench. And even when another quarterback hurt, gets hurt, he's not going to play. So he's not going to play in Houston. But he's not going to play anywhere else because they're not going to trade him. I mean, unless they're pulling a de facto suspension punishment for different things, I don't think that's what they're doing. Um, they should either trade him or play him. This, this situation shouldn't be a year long holdout and waiting for a team to offer three number one draft picks when maybe they're not going to do it because they haven't done it already. But before you, yeah. But you said it already. There's so many complicating circumstances regarding uh, criminal charges possible. There's a grand jury has been convened. Uh, you know, all the I don't know how many 20 some uh, civil accusations. Um, 
there there's a argument to be made that this guy shouldn't be on the field or shouldn't be in the league anymore. I don't know if I'm, you know, ready to make that determination, but if Deshaun Watson never took another snap in the NFL, I wouldn't be heartbroken over it. Right. But if, if, if Houston was willing to trade him for one number one pick and let's say Miami did it, then he'd be on the field. So I don't think that's really the reason he's not on the field. It seems it has more to do with Houston's mismanagement and Deshaun well, Watson's trade requests and the, the broken relationship there. Houston is not forcing the NFL to make a call on it yet. So if the Dolphins or another team were to acquire Deshaun Watson, then the NFL might step in and say, no, he can't play or put him on the, the, uh, the exemption list, the commissioner's exemption list. But with the way the, the Texans are handling the situation is actually letting the NFL off the hook. The NFL doesn't have to make a call. And so it hasn't yet. Um, but we'll talk about that with Armando. In fact, let's, Let's get to Armando uh, right after these words about our sponsor here on Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Thank you for joining the latest edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic, once again here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, also with us, Armando Salguero, formerly of the Miami Herald, but now the senior NFL writer for Outkick.com. And um, I've known, uh, known Armando for a long time and had a chance to reconnect with him down there at Hard Rock Stadium in Miami Gardens, and he's taken a little bit more of a, natu- a national perspective on the NFL, of course, but with his experience covering the Dolphins and having witnessed the carnage on Sunday, I thought it would be good to talk about uh, the AFC East and whatever hopes they had down there. Uh, in South Florida regarding their Dolphins contending for a division title uh, at least two games into the season. That one-on-one record is a bit misleading. Uh, Armando, thanks for doing this. No, it's my pleasure, Tim. Jonah, good to meet you. Good to see you. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's disheartening for Dolphin fans. And you, you stated it perfectly, Tim, by the way. Um, the Dolphins record is one and one we're only two games into a season and yet their desire to win the AFC East that's that's a fraud desire right there because they have to understand that they are not in the class of the Buffalo Bills and if they think that they are because you know teams get better and improve and so forth as the season wears on You you look back at the last two times these two teams played, which was the last game of the 2020 regular season. And this second game of the season, the Bills have outscored the Dolphins by 65 points in those two games. It's not been close. They're not in the same universe as far as being able to win a division title. And it should be noted that last season's finale – the Bills were getting ready to head into the playoffs and were resting a lot of their guys. Josh Allen did start that game, but only played a half, I think it was. And a lot of the guys weren't even on the field in the second half. And still the Bills put up 56 points on the Dolphins, uh, who really didn't have anything to play for, but pride, wanting to make a statement. And then coming into the game on Sunday, a chance to, obviously with the the stakes much higher, take a two-game lead on the Bills, make a statement yet again and fall flat on their face once more. Actually. Uh, and I, you know, I know it's a long time ago and I forget what happened on Sunday. If the dolphins had won that regular season finale, they would have made the playoffs. Oh, so uh, I, that doesn't seem right. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because they don't feel like a playoff team the last two times I saw them play live. Right. They would have finished the season 11 and five and, and been in the playoffs. And yet, as you mentioned, in a game where they needed to win and they were playing basically the Buffalo Bills junior varsity for half the game and they still got blown out. And amazingly, when the Bills backups were in the game, they outplayed the Miami Dolphins starters. Yeah, let me just take a look here uh, since I have the game book handy. The Bills um, actually scored 28 points in each half. So it didn't matter whether the starters were out there or the backups. They still put 28 points on the Dolphins. Uh, they, in the second half, outscored Miami 28 to 20. So they widened the lead uh, even with their backups uh, on the field. Uh Armando, you know, you wrote a column, you wrote several pieces off of the game on Sunday uh, from both a Bills standpoint and a Dolphins standpoint uh, at outkick.com. Um, but, but your piece about the rebuild, I wanted to focus on that because I'm surprised. I thought the Dolphins would be, even with Jacoby Brissett on the field, much more competitive than they were uh, on Sunday. Where... What, what's the gaping hole here? What is the disconnect, I guess, between what we thought about the Dolphins two weeks ago versus what we think about them now uh, and what they either do or do not have? Yeah, that's a, that's, a good, that's a good question and a good topic to discuss. I would say to you that beyond the obvious, which is the Buffalo Bills have Josh Allen and the Miami Dolphins don't, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's other areas where the Dolphins rebuild has just failed. But I, we should the, say, though, Josh Allen was not the difference in that game on Sunday. He correct. was he, I don't want to say he was irrelevant, but. He, no, was, he, he wasn't as much of a factor, but he finished the game uh, because right. unlike the Dolphins, who drafted a quarterback that had durability issues at Alabama, and now, you know, got tackled once and it's terrible and I, and I get it. It's a violent sport, but you drafted a six foot, 217 pound quarterback to, to be your starter, to be your elite guy, quote unquote. And you left on the table, the six foot six, 237 pound guy who's now playing for the Los Angeles Chargers and was the AFC Rookie of the Year offensively last year. So, I mean, decisions like that have repercussions. And we saw one of those repercussions last year, and we saw it again on Sunday where the smallish quarterback was not able to finish the game he started. Uh, beyond that, right? Um, the offensive line is a problem. Beyond that, they have no real running game. They haven't really invested in the running back room. Beyond that, uh, it's a team that spent a lot of resources on guys that, you know, for example, first round pick Noah Igbenogany. He wasn't active for the Dolphins on Sunday. And he's not been active at all this season. So if one of your first round picks from a year ago isn't good enough to be active for Sunday games, that's problematic. And that speaks to your drafting and your personnel department. I'm going to drop this name on you for the second time in three days, uh, Armando, uh, because I enjoyed your reaction when I said it on, on Sunday. But do you think it's time when you're talking about uh, the size uh, issues regarding uh, Tua Tagovailoa and the and the uh, punishment that he takes behind that offensive line. Is it time to reach out to Pat White and uh, do the do your story where we ask Pat White what he thinks uh, what uh, about Tua and what he's going through? <laughs> oh man, that's just not right. That's that's not fair that you do that to me, and it's not fair that you do that to Dolphins fans. You know, Pat White, as you remember. Also a six foot, 212. He, no, 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 no. That's generous. That's generous. He would be out there on the field 
And you would you could look at him and then find the kicker, whoever the kicker was at that time, probably Dan Carpenter. And you could you could look back and forth, back and forth, and you'd be like, Carpenter's bigger than this guy. Pat White was the smallest guy in the field, including the specialists. Pat White's claim to fame is that one time he threw a pass in practice onto the street. Like he was so <laughs> inaccurate. It's not like he missed the receiver on the field. It's not like he threw it to the sideline. The pass went over the the fence onto the street <laughs> that that was adjacent to Dolphins, you know, practice field. And I'm sitting there going, "What is this? This is not the real world that that I'm living in right now." Well, that uh, who was it that hit the? Uh the cart that Bill Parcells was sitting in the golf cart where he was sitting with Bob Greasy. Was that Chad Henney hit the golf uh, cart? And then we yeah. have one in, in Buffalo uh, where EJ Manuel threw one into the hospitality tent at, uh, at uh, Bill's training camp. Yeah, man. I, you know, these stories start to run together after a while and it's uh, how come none of them are about playoff games and Super Bowls and stuff like that. It's not right. <laughs> <laughs> um. Jonah, I don't want to exclude you from the conversation. You got two guys who know each other, and uh, we're we're just having a good old time here, uh, and we're boxing you out. So uh, I wanted to ask Armando what he thought the likelihood or possibility of the next time the Bills see the Dolphins that Deshaun Watson or another quarterback could be playing in Miami. Yeah, that's uh, my short answer. Would probably be the likelihood is very small. Um, simply because the people that are running the Dolphins are probably not going to panic and do what the Houston Texans demand for getting, you know, Deshaun Watson out of town, which is giving up three first round draft picks plus uh, more considerations like two second round picks or three first round picks. Uh, three, three second round picks. If I was running the Miami Dolphins, Deshaun White, uh, excuse me, Deshaun Watson would have been the Dolphins quarterback last week because you look at how the Dolphins have set their team up. Their last six first round picks have been Christian Wilkins, um, who's okay. You know, he's a starter. He's okay. Tua Tungavailoa. Okay. Uh, Noah Igbenogany, who we just mentioned, who can't get on the field. Austin Jackson, who's okay. Uh, Jalen Waddell. And, and to be fair, he's a rookie. Okay. But is he, like, amazing? Right off the bat, no, okay. Jalen Phillips, who came from the University of Miami with the number 18 overall pick, also drafted in the first round this year because the Dolphins had two first round picks this year, three last year. Jalen Phillips, um, I compare him to Greg Rousseau who played next to you know Jalen Phillips at the University of Miami and was drafted number 30. He's better than Jalen Phillips, who was drafted number 18 right now. And so if the Dolphins are thinking, you know, giving up three first round picks is just outrageous. We're not going to do that. We're going to keep our first round picks and we're going to, you know, stockpile like we have been. What good is stockpiling if you can't draft? I'd rather have the sure thing Pro Bowl quarterback, 22 civil complaints aside, right? And 10 criminal complaints aside, then the kind of sort of guys that are okay and may develop and may not. I mean, what's the point of building a team with a, or, or stockpiling draft picks if you're just going to build with okay guys? Yeah, well, the reason Deshaun Watson is available, you just mentioned it. So you just, from a football standpoint, okay. How do you reconcile or how do you think the Dolphins are reconciling the criminal 
the investigation aspect, the, you know, looking down the road and chalking up, there's going to be a suspension at some point. Uh, is he going to be serviceable? I guess I should say, is he available to you after you give up all these draft assets? Where do you think the Dolphins are in that conversation? Well, clearly they're at a place where they're not comfortable doing what the Texans want. And the Texans are holding fast and they are not going to simply give away, quote unquote, Deshaun Watson, because they have arguably a top five, top seven quarterback, regardless of the fact that he's got off the field issues and he's got criminal issues, really, because there is a grand jury investigation and the FBI did talk to the people involved. And there is a likely suspension involved as well. I would say to you this, um, Deshaun Watson is 26 years old. Quarterbacks typically play now to 33, 34. Um, One of them is playing to 44, and he's playing better now than he did in 2007 when he was 30. My point is a year suspension is not the end of a career. And a year is a drastic, dramatic, uh, ominous suspension. And yet, then he'll be 27. So so are you, on the one hand, going to handle the one-year suspension and then have a 27-year-old quarterback who is great? He's great. Or... Are you going to spend more time trying to develop Tua Tonga Vailoa for the next year or two and not know whether he's ever going to be great? You remember the quaint, uh, the quaint 2000s back in the aughts when teams uh, such as the Miami Dolphins were worried about PR crisis, uh, uh, that your player was smoking too much weed? Uh, you know, a <laughs> little different. Then, uh, but yeah, it, there, uh, we, we just don't need this headache, you know, with Ricky Williams or name, name another player. Huh. But now teams, because the quarterback position is so vital and this is a big business, is, w- would be willing to go ahead and just take a guy who's suspended for a year. And I don't know. Do you think the world has just changed enough that, that teams don't, don't care about that, that PR aspect anymore? Well, I don't think they care about the PR aspect because, the, by the way, this just in, the Dolphins aren't the only team that would love Deshaun Watson. Uh, multiple teams, as you know, reached out to the Houston Texans to, to try to lure Deshaun Watson to them. It was the Texans who said, no, that's not enough. You're not giving enough. But they were offering. And they're offering knowing that if the Texans say yes, he's coming. And that's the PR part of all of that. He's coming to your community. You're bringing a person who, you know, has 22 sexual abuse complaints civilly uh, that he's got to take care of, 10 of them criminal complaints. And so they're still doing it. The, The PR part of it, I was talking to someone the other day who is in the league and he said, yes, but what happens after he throws his first touchdown? What's about the PR then? What happens after he throws his 25th touchdown pass of a year or the 30th touchdown pass in a year? Is there gonna be a PR crisis then? And the answer I think, you know, obviously is no, there isn't. Regardless of the fact that, you know, you did bring someone with some, some bad history into your community. I want to ask you your thoughts on the Buffalo bills then Um, as, uh, and you're actually wearing a hat that says out kick on it. And I was going to say with it in your national senior writer hat, uh, your thoughts on the bills and, um, Quite frankly, it was nice to see you in the visiting uh, locker room there at Hard Rock Stadium. I, I don't know how, how often you've, you've ventured into the, uh, or into the, the media room there. Right. Uh, no, that, not often, maybe for bowl games, but it was the winning locker room. And so, obviously, 
that's that's the direction that I was going to take. And this is how I see the Bills. It was a great response by the Bills, right? They had a terrible week, uh, the opening week, and then a terrible week after that, because I'm sure that Monday through Saturday of, you know, after losing to Pittsburgh was the outer ring of hell for Buffalo Bills organization and players. Having said that, they answered. It was great. They proved that, you know, we can deal with adversity. Uh, they are now aware that what they did last year doesn't matter. Uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers made them very aware, I would suppose, of that. And they are now aware that, you know, 2021 is going to be a fight for the most part, unless they play the Dolphins. But uh, this is how I view the Bills. They are they're a good team, a very good team even. I'm not sure that they are a great team. Um, uh, their offensive line needs work. Their secondary is is outstanding in the back end, but uh, you know, Tre'Davious White and who else? Levi, you know, Levi is good, but he's not Tre'Davious White. So uh, the the Gregory Rousseau thing is great. Epinesa developing is great. That helps. That helps a bunch. Um, but. We'll see, man. Uh, you know, the NFL has a, a way of humbling everybody. And the Bills humbled the Dolphins. The Bills got some rough games this year. And we'll see. Uh, I still think they are the class of the division. But that's not the goal, is it? The, winning the division is not it. In not Buffalo, anymore. Right? And so you got to have higher expectations you got to have higher standards. I'm not sure that they're at those high standards quite yet. Did you think Gregory Rousseau would be able to make an impact as early as he has here in Buffalo? No, it's surprising. And it speaks to the coaching that he's getting. You got to understand this is a guy that opted out last year. And so he missed an entire year of playing and developing and getting coached. And the Bills still took him and they are developing him with a quickness. And that is impressive to me. What are some other things around the league, Armando, that, that has your interest? Uh, maybe it's too early. You know, that they, they always say, uh, a coach will say, we don't really know what we're dealing with until October with a lot of teams uh, because your team needs to bounce back, needs to be humbled. Like you say, uh, you know, that coaches need need some time before we, they learn really what they have on their hands. But um, anything in particular that's, that's standing out at here after a couple of games? Well, we've got what Pete Rozelle wanted, right? We, for generally, we have a league that is a, uh, you know, there's a lot of equity in the league. There's a new New Orleans comes out and just destroys green Bay. They humbled green Bay. Right. And guess what happened this week? They got humbled by Carolina, improbably. Uh, you know, Kansas City lost to Baltimore, who lost their opener uh, to, to Las Vegas. The Steelers last week, they, they looked great against the Bills in the second half. Well, guess what? They lost, you know, their, their very next week. So I don't know that the, that we know if there or who the super team is, if there is a super team. I don't think it's the 2-0 and Denver Broncos. No? Right? Uh, no, no, <laughs> I really don't. Uh, I love Teddy Bridgewater. He's from South Florida, but I'm not sure that they're the super team in the AFC. Uh, it, it's a uh, – we don't know what we don't know yet. By the way, uh, tomorrow on Outkick, I'm, I'm going to write about Sam Darnold because everybody's saying, oh, my gosh, he escaped New York. And so now he's had a couple of good games in Carolina. It was all about the New York, you know, disaster that he was a part of. And he gets away from that and he's good now. 
Mm, I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. It's a little early, I think. Um, just to just to note, uh, in the AFC, there are only two two and O teams, as Armando suggested or uh, mentioned, I should say. Denver, one of them. The Las Vegas Raiders, the other one. But also only three zero and two teams. Everybody else is one and one, and it's a little you know more shuffled in the uh, in the NFC. There are a handful of teams that are still two and zero, but yeah, Raiders and Broncos, the only unbeaten teams after just two weeks. I don't, I, you couldn't have seen that. What uh, what do we have to look forward to on Outkick dot com? Anything coming up that you want to tease, Armando? Well, uh, so. I am going from, you know, week to week. The, the, the game that I'm really interested in and my, it's got my, my ears all perked up like a, a happy German shepherd is, uh, is the October 3rd game in which Tampa Bay visits New England. And I just, <laughs> Tom Brady going back to New England uh, to show Bill Belichick what's what and who's who is just, it's just delicious. I, I, I just am so excited about that game. And um, he's, he's 499 yards away from breaking Drew Brees' all-time passing mark for yards. He might do it where? He might do it in New England. <laughs> I don't know. We're not with this start he's off to. He's going to have to slow down to, to, to break it in New England. He might, uh, he might get it within the next two games. Well, that's it. I mean. Oh, wait, that is two games from now. You're right. Yeah. I'm thinking that's three games from now. No, it is two games from now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it, yeah, it seems like he will. It's amazing. <laughs> and it's. Uh, and he'll probably, uh, and it'll be a pass to Rob Gronkowski that does it. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that Tom Brady's not all you know, locked up and, and thinking death to the New England Patriots already because that guy is the most competitive player maybe that has existed in the NFL in the last 20 years. It's just, it's weird and it's wonderful. And I can understand why a guy like that wins seven, is it seven now? Seven or eight Super Bowls? And he still comes back hungry the next year to do it again. It's not human nature to do that. I know it's it, it just not normal for a person to have that much success and not be the least bit comfortable. Tom Brady has more NFL champ. Well, I can't say NFL championships. He has more Super Bowl titles than any team uh, in NFL history. Uh, one more than the New England Patriots because of obviously what he did last year with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But you think of those teams like the 49ers who had Montana and young or the Steelers who've, you know, have been great a handful of times, uh, the dynasty in the seventies and then coming back again with, uh, with Ben Roethlisberger and however, what are they, six they've won. They've had three, three coaches win Super Bowls, but add them all up and it's still not as many as Tom Brady. And I'm sure that your listeners, Tim, you know, most of them or many of them being Buffalo Bills fans, they hear the name Tom Brady and they cringe and it's, ah, that, that, Brady, ah. Yeah, I get it. You hate the guy because he wasn't yours. But there has to come a moment and you have to cross a line where you appreciate what a player is about. Like, Dolphin fans should appreciate Josh Allen. Uh, I mean, that guy is a beast and in sort of like unhuman beastly ways. And I appreciate that. I remember one of the games, you mentioned it in the press box the other day. Was it his rookie year where he's running around and, and you know, some passes are going over there and some over here, but at the end of the game, one pass, he was one pass away from beating the Dolphins, true? He was, and Charles Clay dropped it. And it would have, you know, Charles Clay should have made the catch. Uh, but, yeah, a really magnificent effort. Josh Allen scrambling around, trying to avoid the sack, knew he had to get it to the end zone, finally heaves it up there. Charles Clay drops it. That's the only time he's lost to the Dolphins. He's 6-1 and one all time against uh, Miami. 
and has, I think, three AFC Player of the Weeks uh, against the Dolphins. Uh, might be more. I think it's three, but uh, yeah, he's only played them. What is it now? Seven, seven times. So he's played them seven times and he's the AFC player of the week, half of them. Uh, and the one loss is, should have been a win. Yeah. The, so the joke is that Josh Allen is a very rich man because he owns the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> That's right. I don't remember where I saw it. I think I've, I stole it once in my younger years too, before the internet and anybody could catch me. <laughs> somebody, somebody wrote a lead about, you know, it says on page three of the New England Patriots media guide that Robert Kraft owns them or, or Victor Kayam owns them, but, but it's really Dan Marino or something along those lines. And then I had, I had the occasion. I just switched the names. You know, I was, I was young and desperate and trying to impress an, an editor. Probably everybody's written that at least once. Every, right. right. Yeah. We've all written it. Yeah. That's true. It was a we tale of two halves or whatever the hell. Yeah. We've, yeah. <laughs> I've gotten to the point where I announce to people that I'm stealing their stuff. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, like someone the other day emailed me uh, about the Miami Hurricanes, right? Who once upon a time, amazing, not so amazing anymore. And he's called them the horror canes, not the hurricanes. And I told him, I'm taking that. That's mine now. It now belongs to me. I'm taking that. And so I announce it to folks now when I'm stealing stuff. Before we let you go here, Armando, but you're down there, you're, you're immersed in it. I know you don't cover the hurricanes beat, but you're so aware and connected. What is it about my Miami hurricanes in their fall from being one of the elite teams in an area where you can't, you can't drive through a neighborhood and not pass a five-star recruits house uh, in, you know, in three counties down there. Uh, and wh what's the difference? What, what happened? Well, start with the point that you just made. Um, the NFL, there are six towns in the state of Florida with at least 12 NFL players who came from that town. Miami has the most of, of any of them with 19. Uh, Plantation, which is like a mile and a half from where the Dolphins train, is second or third. Fort Lauderdale is, you know, third or fourth. In other words, Florida is a hotbed for high school football. Um, and it is not even close, not even close, including California and Texas. It used to be once upon a time that the University of Miami, which is really a sleepy 13,000 student private institution, drew a line, their recruiting line across the state at Lake Okeechobee. Everything Lake Okeechobee down, including Palm Beach, Broward and Dade County, they're gonna get the best players, meaning they were pretty darn good for a long time. Well, as with everything else, you know, other teams see that, other, you know, programs see that, and they are not sleepy 13,000 student private institutions. They are monolith, you know, 100,000 students, boosters, a booster club that includes 40,000 people, and they come into South Florida and they can recruit in various ways to where they can convince people to leave South Florida. So that's one thing. The other thing is the University of Miami, I'm not sure that the administration really values, uh, you know, football as much as it once did. Even when Jimmy Johnson was the coach, he had to fight to keep, um, standards, academic standards at a certain level to where he could get great players. Uh, Miami fancies itself academically as the Stanford of the East, which is hogwash because it's not, but the standards are higher than say Florida or FSU or Alabama or you know Georgia, stuff like that. So it's harder to get players. All of those things combined, 
and the fact that they can't necessarily play, pay uh, both their coaching staffs, the staff, and maybe the players. Um, you know, there's the there's the the problem with the University of Miami no longer being the dominant football team and the dominant football program that it once was. Do you, is there a belief that the name image likeness um, development could help because Miami is a, a market that really does value sports in terms of its advertising? You know, you see so many former players in the media in, in South Florida, more so than in other places. You know, former players are all over the place uh, with shows and hosting this and doing that and in this business. And I don't know. And just just a thought that they can keep them there, keep the locals there. So you have some high level of high school fame that you can make it make more money in in South Florida and, and stay with the Hurricanes. I don't know. Um, maybe. But and I thought about that and you might be right still based on what may happen down the road but the counter to that is i saw what the alabama quarterback who's like in his first year starting a million dollars or whatever yes yeah um so no <laughs> yeah, they have car dealerships in uh in tuscaloosa too a lot yeah <laughs> and uh and it's not just you know tuscaloosa it's birmingham and you know mobile and look the bottom line is uh, Miami is not the program in the state anymore. That's Florida. Uh, Alabama is the program in the nation. And, right. and, and, you know, the next one down isn't Miami. <laughs> so, so there's that. Armando, I've enjoyed this. Uh, thanks uh, for, for giving me part of your afternoon and uh, coming on the show. And um, whatever you need out of me, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it, Tim. Jonah, good talking to you. Good meeting you. And uh, you guys have, have a great time going forward. Let me plug Armando uh, one more time. Armando Salguera is the uh, national NFL. No, wait, let me get it right. Let me, let me say it correctly. I'm kind of guessing right now because I don't yeah, want to look down at my notebook. Senior there. NFL writer for yeah. Outkick.com. Senior NFL writer for Outkick.com. Not a yeah. columnist, not a reporter, not um, just a just a gas bag. Yeah, <laughs> That's all I senior am. NFL writer for Outkick.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at Armando Salguero. Uh, S A L G U E R O. Yeah. Right. Did you have to, that's everybody's dream is just to have your name as a Twitter handle. Did you have to jump on that early? Are there other Armando Salgueros out there? Actually, there are other Armando Salgueros and it's like shocking to me. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is, bro. Not a lot of them in Buffalo though. So there's that. No, no. <laughs> or Western you New York. When you travel, when you travel to Western New York once a year, you don't have a, a favorite uh, Cuban joint up here that you like to hit. I, I don't know, no, no, <laughs> I really don't. But and and by the way, I you know, I I love Western New York. It's awesome, right? And being from South Florida, the best thing is going to to Buffalo, and I've been doing it for thirty years in December in you know january once upon a time the dolphins and the bills would get together three times a year uh and one of them was in january when they would play in the playoffs and typically it was in in buffalo in orchard park because the bills usually won the division and the dolphins were usually a wild card and i loved it uh but not for cuban food for the for the snow, for the experience. I was making a joke. I was making a joke. And believe me, it would be like us looking for a wing joint in South Florida. You know, you have so many, so much good Cuban food where you are. You don't need to come to Buffalo and find a Cuban joint. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, favorite? If there favorite. is one. 
I'm sure there's one somewhere. I don't know. I'm sure. Uh, we're, you know, humans, they're everywhere. But uh, it's not the same. You can't do donuts in the parking lots down here as easily as you can when it snows up there in you doing donuts with your rental car in the parking lot because there is a foot and a half of snow on the ground. You're doing and it on purpose? Of course. Okay, good. But I didn't know if it was because you you just don't know how to drive in it. Uh, well, maybe that was part of it initially, but after a while it became a tradition. Ask Jason Cole about that sometime. Okay, I didn't know this. I know yeah. you enjoyed coming up here, but I didn't know that uh, I didn't know about the donuts. Oh yeah. I thought you were talking about actually tailgating or something. We were just talking about food and then you start talking about donuts. And I'm like, I don't know about these don't oh, no, no, no. like parking lot donuts. Uh, donuts. I like, see. Car. Right, right. Yeah. Armando, thanks for this. All right, Tim. Jonah, be well. Thank you, Armando. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.